So good evening, everybody. So there are plenty of slides are there, but so but I'll make it very short. I have five cases, but I think uh, if time permits only, I'll present all the cases. I think if uh, I may not be able to present more than two or three cases. So this will be more of an uh, not very uncommon cases, but some of these cases which most of the times we miss it. So I'm not going to tell all the theory part. First, I'll straight away go to the case. So this is a 50-year-old male <coughs> with a diabetic and hypertensive and uh, who has CKD and uh, he was on treatment for pulmonary cox. So he was admitted with fever and hypoxia. So he was investigated routinely. He was admitted under pulmonologist actually. The lung shows bilateral shadows with creatinine elevated 2.69. This is an important factor in this case. And uh, of course, his total count also elevated. Basing on this, patient was, uh, patient was being treated as a pneumonia. So they have started, these, are the, these were the antibiotics. You, you can see cefepime, moxiflox, and rest of all ATT and those drugs. So at this stage, patient was referred to us for confusional and uh, involuntary movements of all limbs. When we saw the patient, she was confused, not responding to commands, but he was conscious, having involuntary movements. So at this point of stage, we thought it was an acute confusional state for evaluation. So routinely, we advised for MRI, EEG and CSF analysis. MRI, you can believe me, it is not much and CSF also was normal. Then this is, this is MRI and this was the EEG. You can see the EEG and uh, you can see the EEG. Here you can see the continuous waveform, pa waveform pattern which is around 2 per second and these are called triphasic waves. They are continuously running. You can see a negative wave then followed by a positive wave and negative wave. So this is a triphasic wave. So when we see the triphasic waves, generally we should think in terms of whether it is a seizure or some metabolic condition which is producing uh, these triphasic waves. So sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between triphasic waves whether it is a seizure that what we call it as a probably clinically if it is not apparent we call it as a non-convulsive seizures or it is something like a metabolic encephalopathy. So as it was 2 per second, to, so we actually as a diagnostic test we give midazolam bedside EEG so it has slowed down. So routinely we gave levetiracetam also and you can see after giving levetiracetam also the triphasic waves are just present but there was slowing is there. So patient on day 4, so we were called on day 3, so patient was not responding to commands but he was able to still move the limbs. So what we did is uh, because seizures were, I mean a patient is still confused and EEG still showing triphasic waves, we thought it could be some of the drugs induced because CSF was normal, MRI was normal and EEG was showing triphasic waves and there is no seizure activity because after giving anti-epileptic drugs also still these waves are persisting and most of the times triphasic waves unless they are classical we consider it as a more of a metabolic or some drug induced. So in this case, so on day 2 itself after investigation so normal where the triphasic waves are appearing so we stopped a cefepime. So you can see the uh, on day 2 also still triphasic waves are present. So next still these are triphasic waves of course I just want to tell you uh, about the triphasic waves I don't want to teach the EEG at this point of time. So again triphasic waves are there and what it, we did was because on the fourth day also in the presence of renal failure patient sensorium is deteriorating and triphasic waves are not going and patient is still uh, I mean his creatinine levels were little deteriorated from 2.2 to it, it became 3.5. So normally what we can do is usually when we start uh, these, quinal, uh, these uh, cephalosporins when we start on fourth uh, from second day to fifth day they can have they can develop uh, this uh, neurotoxicity. The neurotoxicity when they develop what we should do is we should discontinue the drug and in the press sometimes when the patient is not improving and deteriorating we can do dialysis. So this patient was taken up for dialysis 
and post dialysis his sensorium improved and you can see the eeg got uh, also eeg also became normal in subsequent days only with one uh, cycle of dialysis patient completely became normal so the take him the point here is any patient who is in altered sensorium in icu we should not uh, i mean we should consider that not all the patients are because of some seizures so bedside eeg plays a very cr crucial role in these type of cases and in this case especially this has helped and first of all we should have insight that cephalosporins especially cefepime this drug is one of the drug which can cause seizures even in uh, renal failure patient it is common but even in non renal failure non kidney disease patients also you can uh, develop this one now there is a column here this is for mainly for neurologists of course yes and also critical care people we can see that this typical tri triphasic waves and atypical triphasic waves one sentence i want to tell you is typical triphasic waves are seen in classical pattern in non epileptic conditions whereas atypical uh, most of the times we see in case of non convulsive status and atypical uh, triphasic waves they may not respond both may respond to the drug but in typical their conscious level usually doesn't improve whereas in atypical that is in case of seizures you can see that uh, this patient conscious level can improve so you can see this is the typical triphasic wave this is the positive this is the negative wave this is the positive wave and this is the big negative wave and uh, this is the uh, atypical triphasic wave as you can see so now they can progress into different manner so if you take cephalosporin uh, cephalosporin induced or cefepime induced nephrotoxicity is uh, common condition which most of the times they miss it some studies have shown that in case of renal failure patients 20% of them they they have this cephalosporin uh, this cefepime induced nephrotoxicity uh, neurotoxicity i'm sorry cephro uh, cefepime induced neurotoxicity and in our patient it is patient is less than 60 years he is uh, having renal dysfunction and mri of course there are mild changes only so there are so many drugs which can cause seizures in the icu there is a long list but most important what we have to remember is one is cephalosporins especially cefepime is the commonest one and sometimes we see with ceftriaxone also which we treat for with meningitis other common drugs are quinolines and in carbapenems imipenem is the one of the common drug which can produce seizure so any patient in icu when he when he was when he is having altered sensorium high index of suspicion is very important so this is one of the case which was referred by the pulmonologist thank you gopi for uh, referring uh, this case uh, gopi for referring this case uh, so i don't want to go into this one so take home message drug induced encephalopathy and seizures not an uncommon cause so cefepime induced neurotoxicity well defined well defined complication in critical patients and most of the times we see them as triphasic waves and even seizures can be documented in these patients and it is more common in renal fa failure renal failure and bedside eeg is one of the important thing which will help and uh, nowadays this is going to uh, make a lot of difference in diagnosing the patients so after this case i think any 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 questions you can ask because i'll be going to the next case this is a, this is a very rare long case so which will be dealing that uh, we will be discussing that case yes sir also come to produce physiological yes sir yeah yeah correct you are right i was just telling about common drugs i agree you have the video of the patient uh no <laughs> Uh, no he is saying basically it was referred for he is saying more of a tremorless tremorlessness tra involuntary movements like something yeah it was not myoclonus uh, definitely not definitely myoclonus he is saying so any questions you can ask because after the next case you may forget about this one first case so next case is a new onset refractory status epilepticus so this is one of the rare cases Uh, but um, we may see frequently i mean because now it is being recognized of late so actually first of all nars is non uh, new onset 
refractory status epilepticus. So what is status epilepticus? If any patient is having seizures, convulsive seizures for more than 5 minutes, we call it as a non, uh, we call it as a status epilepticus. So when we keep the EEG for some of the patients, if there is an electrical activity that but which, which does not have any external seizures or post convulsive seizures, if the patient is showing EEG, electrical activity, running seizures for more than 10 to 12 minutes, we call it as a non convulsive status epilepticus. Sometimes they can have brief period of attacks in an hour. So that time we calculate as more than 20 percent in an hour. So like that we define as non convulsive status epilepticus. So other one is refractory status epilepticus. So when a patient comes to the ER or outside when we see the patient, the first drug which was given is metazolam or lorazepam. The next drug given is whether it is a levetiracetam, whether it is a uh, uh, phenytoin or sodium valproate, these are the drugs given. So even after giving two drugs, if the patient, even after giving those two class of drugs, one is the digipam group, other one is the secondary prevention drugs, still patient is seizing, we call it as a refractory status epilepticus. Then what is super, ref super refractory status epilepticus? After giving those two drugs and patient is still seizing, then we go for the one of the three anesthetic agents, whether it is a metazolam, continuous IV infusion, pentobarbital or thiopentol or propo, uh, uh, pentobarbital or thiopentol or propofol. Among these three drugs, if the patient is still seizing with these drugs, we call it as a supra, uh, super refractory status epilepticus. Nor I already told you, new onset refractory status epilepticus, if you detect it first time, first time patient itself present with a uh, patient, patient present with seizures without any identifiable cause within the first 72 hours. But still some of the authors they include autoimmune and post uh, viral etiologies also as NORS if they present first time with the known etiologies also. Now to make it, uh, I mean now I told those definitions because we are going to deal this, uh, uh, discuss this case. This is very interesting lady, this is a NORS. The incidence of first of all status epilepticus is about uh, 20 to 30 percent among the uh, epileptic patients they can come. In that one, NORS is very, in status epilepticus, NORS is just uh, 20 percent in some of the studies. So it is not very common. Now we have a patient, uh, 32 year old uh, pregnant lady, second, uh, third gravita, once she got aborted and she is fixed 15 weeks of gestation age on 31st May, she presented with two seizures. So I am not going to read the line to line because one thing is she was given, she was treated with metazolam and levetiracetam outside. Afterwards, she was shifted here. So after shifting here, patient was having seizure in between again while coming. So patient was given again uh, continued levetiracetam and they gave metazolam. Now when they examined, patient is conscious but was confused. She was following commands. There is no evidence of any meningitis. There is no neck stiffness. So her abdom per abdomen, I mean uh, it was admitted under the gynecologist. Uh, of course, both of us were dealing and pregnancy she is 14 to 16 weeks of uh, gestation and fetal heart rate is 140. Now MRI was done because in pregnancy if any patient pre presents with seizures continuously, uh, MRI is a safe modality of the investigation. So you can, we have done MRI to exclude any press that is post reversible uh, 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 encephalopathy syndrome or CSVT. So those two things were excluded. So there is no organic pathology what we can see in this one. So all the necessary investigations were done, patient was shifted to ICU, patient was still seizing. So now after investigating, so on the day of admission all the reports were sent and basic routines were normal including blood counts, renal function tests and electrolytes were also normal. Now as the patient was seizing in spite of two anti, I mean uh, patient was still seizing, so phosphenetin was given because initially midazolam was given, next afterwards the lower, of course same benzodiazepine derivative long standing, uh, long acting lorazepam was given in the ER and so they belong to one class of drugs, afterwards patient was given levetiracetam and was informed to us. So, 
the first drug, I mean seizure preventing drug, whether you give phosphenitoin, whether you give levetiracetam or whether you give sodium valpate, all of them have equal efficacy. So they have already gave levetiracetam, patient is still having uh, seizures. So phosphenitoin or phenytoin was started and it was uh, given loading dose and maintenance drug maintenance was started. Now we know that we are entering into a refractory status seizures, patient still seizing. So she was a pregnant lady, we have very, I mean we are very apprehensive because uh, we have to save the baby and mother, of course mother is more important than the baby first, uh, uh, we know that one. So after giving those two drugs, she has gone into almost refractory status. So literature wise, some of them they tried phenobarbitone because sometimes even routine status also when you give those two drugs, if the patient is still seizing, you can try another drug. But of course, by this time, patient has reached refractory status. So EEG was connected, bedside EEG was connected. You can see, the, see this is on the left side, the odd numbers, the even is on the right side. You can see it is starting from the posterior and uh, of course, so, so you can see, I mean it is difficult. Uh, now you can see this is the spread of the seizure activity. This is the spiking you can see on both the sides, left more than the right and eventually it has spread to both the sides. So that means patient is having both electrical and uh, clinical seizures were there. So we call it as a, so patient is continuously seizing, so it falls into status epilepticus, two class of drugs were given, in fact three class of drugs were given, still seizing, so it falls into refractory status epilepticus. Now we have to take a call because she has gone into refractory status. Now we have to take a call. We have to try one of the three drugs. The three drugs what we usually try is uh, anesthetic drugs. Among them were midazolam IV, propofol and or thiopental. One of those three drugs we should try. So of course I'll show you. this is the birth suppression achieved. So, so patient uh, uh, has gone into, is entering into supra, supra, supra refractory status. So by that time patient was intubated, taken a decent and uh, LP was done and CSF analysis, autoimmune profile was also sent and viral encephalitis and also meningitis and encephalitis panel was also sent. So LP was uh, normal, protein is 7, sugar is 88, of course cells were less than 5, it was normal. So, because she was not responding to the, those two drugs, among two, those three drugs, metazolam is supposed to be the safest medication. So, IV metazolam was started in this patient and whenever any patient of new onset refractory status epilepticus comes, most of the time, 70 percent of the times, we do not know the cause. So, we, call, we take it as a cryptogenic. Remaining patients, we deal it as, uh, as a, whether it is an underlying encephalitis or a in the tensephalitis viral or autoimmune we consider. So in this patient especially we consider it as more, more of an probably it is a cryptogenic or autoimmune by default because there is no evidence of any encephalitis. So we started her on methylprednisolone because now we have to start the disease modifying drugs. So here we are giving anti-epileptic drugs to suppress the seizure activity and we are giving immunomodulating drugs like methylprednisolone and IVIG to suppress the seizure activity. So we gave methylprednisolone 1 gram for three, 3 days and even on uh, after starting metazolam even after 24 hours the seizure activity is not suppressing. So next instead of going to the other one now we have other drugs I mean apart from metazolam, propofol and thiopental those all three drugs they act on the almost they act on the same receptors that is they, they act on the uh, same receptors that was the reason. So ketamine was brought and ketamine was started in this patient. So with after starting ketamine then methylprednisolone was given and acyclovir was also started because the HSVPCR reports are awaited. Even after giving ketamine also patient is still seizing. So we are in the process of reducing metazolam. At one step we thought of reducing metazolam but patient uh, seizure activity has increased. So we thought maybe combination of the drug may help and we continued ketamine and metazolam but still the patient did not respond. Then we started propofol because basing on the EEG we and patient is still having status so we started propofol. So 
by this time we have entered into supra refractory status so we have all the options we have utilized used the all the options so went back to the literature we again thought maybe some of the patients they respond to among those three class of drugs metazolam propofol and thiopentol though after metazolam ketamine is the choice we have already taken the choice patient is still having seizures we started propofol after starting propofol also uh, because when starting propofol the st we took the family consent because this is very interesting problem here really we faced it because here propofol is it crosses placenta it can cause fetal distress so we discussed with the family and pregnancy was terminated because in the literature sometimes if you terminate the pregnancy some of them they say that seizures will be terminated but i think it is it is not i mean it is it is not the protocol actually terminating pregnancy is not like a protocol it is only to save the mother and also to anyway because of so many drugs patient may go into teratogenic uh, effects may have and fetal distress can happen that was the reason this pregnancy was terminated in this patient so this is the autoimmune profile was sent both serum and uh, csf and also this encephalitis panel also was sent all were negative so we are clueless whether it is autoimmune or it is a cryptogenic but definitely it doesn't look like an infective so we were continuing steroids on the third day we started uh, ivig the reason was because uh, with methylprednisolone sometimes in the combination the seizures may, co may come down the advantage with steroid is it acts quickly though the risk of infection is high but with the advantage of ivig is it could be a disease specific so that was the reason as per the literature also so we went as per the step wise when we went to ivig also so ivig also was given so meanwhile some of the studies refractory cases some of them they had response with lacosamide though we don't have a i mean with uh, because of literature background and various because they are few cases so we gave uh, lacosamide also so that 400 mg iv stat followed by 200 mg we started so patient still having seizures so she was on uh, uh she we have tried benzodiazepine group of drugs then we went to ketamine and also she was on propofol was discontinued after 48 hours the reason of discontinuing propofol after 48 hours is because more than 48 hours in this set of patients they can go into propofol infusion syndrome where it is has a bad prognosis so that was the reason propofol was discontinued and among midazolam propofol and thiopental we have tried midazolam and it is a safe medication we went to propofol we discontinued then we went to thiopental now after starting thiopental and also meanwhile uh, i mean after starting thiopental the frequency of seizures have come down uh, electrical seizures but still they were running and now after fifth day uh, i mean uh, when we give thiopental it doesn't mean that we should always go for a birth suppression this is called birth suppression you can see birth suppression means always you need not achieve this one in this one is the total activity cortical activity will be suppressed most of the times it will be firing in between this is birth suppression because i have to go back again to show that one which i think it is not required and so birth suppression is attained so not every every time in seizures birth suppression should be attained to control seizures some of them they still feel, i mean many of them believe that just controlling seizures is enough rather than achieve, achieving birth suppression because of the uh prognosis so now patient uh, so after with so many drugs so patient will have problems so we are continuing oral uh, anti epileptic drugs midazolam was tapered off because anyway it is not going to work and ketamine also was tapered off and now she was on thiopentone with thiopentone seizures have become localized to only to left side and occasionally spreading to right side and previously it was running continuously for hours i mean one hour like that so now it it is now the seizure activity is in a hour almost every uh, i mean uh, uh, each each do each episode duration was 2 minutes that is only electrically so this is the status of the patient thiopental also was discontinued because i mean discontinued and uh, eeg was reviewed again so seizures are still coming but they are electrical seizures of course patient is completely i mean is not conscious to know whether patient is having 
convulsive seizures because of the high dose of these anesthetic drugs. And now patient is not on any these of IV anesthetic drugs and patient is on oral anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, so, so this is a one of the difficult and uh, difficult case which made us sleepless nights, making us sleepless nights for the last one month. And uh, so I already discussed this table, it is nothing. Uh, just to remember one thing in this table what any patient who is who comes with seizures, please do not under treat. You have to treat with proper dosages of anti-epileptic drugs. The first drug preferred is lorazepam because it is a long acting drug. If you cannot main, you cannot attain IV access in 3 minutes, you can give uh, midazolone because midazolone can be given intramuscularly, lorazepam can be given IV. So, if you can attain IV, slow IV of lorazepam is the best choice and suppose if you do not have a hospital, I mean if the patient is on outpatient basis, suppose you are go, you go and you go to pick up the case, there you can give because to secure uh, IV line it may be difficult, you can give medazolam about, uh, I mean you can give medazolam about 10 ml, uh, uh, 10 mg uh, intramuscularly. Otherwise, you can sec if you secure a line slowly, you can give lorazepam. After that, immediately when the patient comes, you can start one of the first line agents. Uh, I am repeating this one because this is important. So, you can give levetiracetam, phenytoin or sodium valpate. One of those drugs can be given. Of course, nowadays they say you can give phenobarbitone, you can give lacosamide. And still if patient has seizures, you can repeat the one of those two drugs again. Not the same drug, other drug you can repeat it. If you give levetiracetam, you can give uh, uh, remaining other, remaining one of the other two drugs in the remaining those two drugs. So, if the patient still do not achieve seizures with those drugs, probably you have to go with the next line of the uh, anesthetic agents, whether medazolam or propofol or thiopentol. With this one also it is not attaining, then go for the next level is ketamine. Ketamine is the drugs which they tried. Of course, uh, mortality in these patients is very high. It is more than nearly in status epilepticus itself, the mortality is little, uh, we have to be careful. Especially in supra refractory epilepticus, the mortality is still high. It is nearly about 30 to 40 percent. And this NORS, the mortality is nearing about, some studies they say 20 percent, some studies they say 50 percent among these individuals. So, now why we should treat always status epilepticus in time? Because of three things. One, if you, if we, if the patient continuously seizes, so there is a chance of uh, cortical damage. So that there is a damage of the neurons. That is why even, uh, I mean, especially in convulsive seizures, we should treat within 30 minutes. Seizure should be kept under control. Though the definition says five minutes, we should treat within 30 minutes. And suppose if status epilepticus in focal seizures uh, with impairment of consciousness, you can have a leverage up to 10 minutes. In the case of something like a non-convulsive status, you call it as if the seizure is lasting for 12 minutes continuously or 20 percent of the EEG in one hour. Now, how aggressively you have to treat, still the data is incomplete in these cases. So, better always uh, you, we have to treat these patients aggressively. So, take home messages, even if it is a first seizure, treat adequately. If patient still confused and not recovering after first seizure, always think of non-convulsive status and continuous EEG monitoring and aggressive management is very, very important. So, I think this is the case and I have other three cases. Uh, you can ask anything in this case, you can, this one. It is a difficult case, but of course, it, it case also may, made us Everybody. Uh, sir, what is your experience or on antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis? When will you consider it as uh, antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis? Can Honestly, if you get it positive, it is autoimmune. If you get negative and especially if all other things are excluded, maybe we have to treat it as autoimmune. But sometimes like LGG1, they have hyponatremia with involuntary movements. So, you can consider it as, but NMDA receptor is the commonest one auto, auto, I mean autoimmune encephalitis. So, there I think NMDA receptor antibodies also we have to send the test. Uh, my protocol is instead of sending the antibodies first, I do the PET scan honestly speaking. 
because most of the times pet scan helps in picking up autoimmune encephalitis rather than because we spend for uh, antibodies uh, uh, nearly about 20 30000 maybe with that 10000 or 12000 we can get a pet scan report so most of the times i feel personally pet scan is more sensitive than these antibodies because we don't know about these labs also because we outsource them we don't know but safer side we send the investigation but i treat as per clinically and per as per pet scan if it comes positive i will be the happiest person do you suspect autoimmune negative antibody and species antibody negative interpreted in this species we are suspecting it Yes, it's normal. Yes. Then you have sent both serum and CSF. Yes. So being a both of your epileptologists, no, could you have managed this patient differently? Uh, sir, my take here, like uh, initially, rather than starting uh, starting midazolam infusion alone, because as we know, like once status sets in, benzodiazem receptors are actually internalized, and what we see is more of NMD and uh, AMPA receptors which are expressed, and that keeps on perpetuating status. So when we fail with initial two IV anti-epileptic medications, like let, let it be levetiracetam, phosphonatum, or valproate, then when we start with mid, uh, IV anesthetic agents, my uh, take would be we'll start both midazolam and ketamine both together. So we'll address that uh, part. Yeah, uh, in this case, we mechanism. started midazolam, IV infusion. All. Ketamine too, sir. Two. Both together. Yeah, ketamine was brought immediately in 24 hours. What they did, actually. Uh, that's what we did. It. Uh, yeah, that's true, sir. We didn't no. wait for the other drugs to, uh, other drugs, because some protocols, because some of them, they felt that, in fact, some of them, they said, instead of going to IV medicine, go directly to ketamine. Mm -hmm. So, true, 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 but as per up, day, up to date and as per other papers also, they say, among the IV, because still some of them, they argue that they feel that thiopentol is the best one. True, true, In sir. our patient also, actually thiopentol worked. True. But the problem is, always tr we try to play safe. So, midazolam is a safer drug than those two drugs. So, that was the reason we started IV midazolam. Actually, it was little bit suppressed. So, but still, uh, after 24 hours, we, are, we didn't uh, achieve. And also, that time, she was uh, still pregnant. So, we brought ketamine. We added ketamine. No response with ketamine or medazolam. Then we tried propofol. Then we went to thiopentol. Yes. In fact, we did it. We do, rather than traditional protocol, new protocol was followed by, by, as you said, by bringing ketamine quite early. True, true, sir. And so, in fact, some of the, I mean, uh, traditional people they may say that you have started ketamine, and on the other way around, they may say that you should have waited. Why did you start ketamine? Yes. I completely agree with uh, the line of management, sir. Only thing what I would uh, do is, as Komal sir was asking you. But in the, in this one, I agree. I'm sorry. Uh, one thing is, instead of IVIG, plasmapheresis would have been preferred. But attendants were not very keen on plasmapheresis. They are knowledgeable. In fact, I also feel plasmapheresis is a proper treatment. Uh, so, but still, at the time she was uh, pregnant, and they don't want to take any this one. So that was the reason we we had a choice. We took the choice of, but studies say one of it you can take. But personally, I feel that I take plasmapheresis. The reason is after giving plasmapheresis, you can do uh, doing plasmapheresis, you can give IVIG. But after giving IVIG, if you do plasmapheresis, you are going to remove all the antibodies. So that was the reason I took this call of IVIG after taking the consent. Please go ahead. I'm sorry to uh, nothing, sir. I come. So explain with propofol. Propofol, uh, I have not used in many patients. Eh? My first any, any specific no, Especially, I am just uh, because of the apprehension of propofol infusion syndrome. Oh, actually, we I had a patient. There was a HSV encephalitis patient. Uh, That's way back in uh, ten years ago. We have used propofol twenty five days, uh, up to six hundred milligrams per hour. Young lady, six hundred milligrams per hour. She could come out and then with no deficits now. So that's an apprehension most of the times. It's a theoretical apprehension, but uh, if you take precautions properly, appropriately, still propofol is, is a very good drug, beautiful drug. And in this patient, actually, could you have tried uh, vagal nerve stimulation? Uh, vagal nerve stimulation so here, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Studies, they show uh, neuromodulation has been tried in status epilepticus. Uh, uh, but actually, there are reports, not the invasive vagal nerve stimulation, so there is a recent uh, publication that uh, they just stimulate the auricular branch of the 
vagus superficially transcutaneous yes transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation and then it was a small study of three patients only from bangalore actually mm -hmm. from one of our senior from liman he did from st johns and then patients had uh, good uh, electrographic as well as clinical improvement both all three patients some one patient has was actually was in status for almost for 23 24 days maybe maybe we can try that yeah if we still the have next uh, thing what we are thinking is you now she has responded little i mean uh, not mm -hmm. i don't say that completely she is out of the problem as you said uh, the i mean ketogenic diet also we are trying and also uh, uh, uh vagal nerve stimulation also uh, they have tried so i want to show you the important slide and close it off i have one more case good case so yeah so i should congratulate our frontline heroes critical care team people all these people including our eeg technologists they really were very patient with me and the patient attendants also continuously monitoring though we are bothering even in the night times and uh, thank you ramana and uh, your team vishnu siddharth niklesh nitin and shiva and uh, so just i will show one slide this is a case i mean a very interesting case this is a case presented as encephalitis shifted from uh, guntur district so patient was treated as because she was in confusional state so patient was treated as uh, herpes herpes encephalitis with the antiviral and steroids so the, she didn't improve that was the reason they brought to us so i had repeated the mri you can see this is the artery of percheron infarct this this ha, this is the ischemic stroke where sometimes it may be missed out uh, the incidence is very less 0.22 to 3% so artery of percheron infarct they can typically present like movement disorders like parkinsonism features like alter sensory and all they can present so this is very interesting because you can see here uh, the blood circulation here will be arising from the perforators to from a common trunk so which is supplying to the both the thalamus that was the reason patient will have multiple symptoms and they most of them they think like it is something like an encephalitis case so japanese encephalitis or other cases like deep venous deep venous sinus thrombosis they can be mistaken for that one so this is a very good case uh, just of course there are other slides which i am not going to do, do anything there are uh, one thing so i would like to thank my colleague uh, apart uh, apart from the critical care team dr venkat swami who is really behind this case working hard to look eeg is ours together and of course my other team other members dr raja coordinator and my neuro nurse and uh, i thank dr swami and critical care team once again and also and also neurotechnologists thank you thank you, thank you for uh, bringing up very hot topic sir that's a very important uh, entity which we all have to be aware about thank you